Hello, and welcome to the presentation on the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, more commonly known as the CISG. I'm Alexandra Ford with Nathan Gravely and Leah Co. We'll be talking about a variety of topics today, from the creation of the CISG to what contracts it applies to, the differences between American contract law and the CISG, and lastly, what courts domestically and internationally have ruled regarding contracts entered into under this treaty. The CISG was established in 1980 by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. The CISG has attracted over 77 different signatory nations, making it one of the most successful international uniform trade laws in history. Nations have been signing on to the CISG since its inception, including the United States in 1988. The most recent signatory nation, Benin, will begin operating under the CISG in August of 2012. Here is the full list of signatory nations operating under the CISG. If your clients are in the United States and they are conducting a business-to-business -business sales transaction with a company in any of these nations, the CISG will be the default governing law. So many nations have signed on to the CISG because it was created as an international equalizer. This treaty was designed to provide uniform international standards for contracts for the sale of goods. One central goal of the CISG was to protect companies in developing nations with less access to legal services than from companies in industrialized nations. To further explain why the UN was created, the UN created the CISG, we turn to Professor Richard Snyder. Professor Snyder is the former international lawyer with extensive experience structuring international transactions. What prompted the UN to create the CISG? What prompted the UN to create the CISG? The CISG is an effort by the commercial lawyers in countries in the civil law tradition and in the common law tradition to reach a kind of uniformity and certainty with the application of contract principles in the international commercial world. So what prompted the creation of the CISG was actually, it grew out of the United Nations uh, Committee on International Trade Law, the UNCTRAL, and um, the effort there was to basically bring the, these two great legal traditions together, the common law and the civil law, and hammer out a compromise that would use some common law principles and some civil law principles and make it attractive enough that lawyers representing companies in these countries that would be eventually contracting states, that lawyers in these countries would want to resort to this convention, that it would be preferable to their national law. And so a lot of things were put in the convention to make that more likely that lawyers would do that. Um, and one of those things is that the convention um, requires courts or, or, or asks courts to, when they interpret the convention, to look at the courts of, of other countries. So whereas the United States courts tend to look really at precedent only in their own district or in their own state, here the convention is saying, no, a U.S. court should look to Germany or should look to China as to how a particular part of the convention is, is interpreted. And so that should give companies in Germany and China and the United States this kind of certainty and predictability about their contracts that would make it attractive for them to use the Vienna Convention on International Sale of Goods, the C CISG. So, um, so what prompted it was really this kind of age-old effort that has been around since the Renaissance to give um, companies a way to be independent of their um, national laws, to give them a body of law that they could resort to that would take them out of the national legal context and put them into a context that was more certain and understandable for them as commercial actors.
Because the CISG applies to several different nations, those with both civil and common law governments, the statutory construction of the CISG is unique. Unlike the laws in the United States, the CISG calls for a broad interpretation of its provisions. In fact, Article 7 of the CISG encourages courts interpreting contracts to be mindful of an international spirit, encouraging universal standards. These universal standards apply to com companies in both developing and industrial nations, allowing for greater equality among the companies. First and foremost, these universal standards apply to contracts between companies whose first place of business are in different signatory states. Second, the CISG also applies to contracts between companies from different states if the rules of private international law call for the application of the law of a signatory country. So, if a company in a signatory state, for example, a German seller, enters into a contract for the sale of goods with a company in a non-signatory state, let's say a British buyer, the private international choice of law rules of the forum state may require that application of German law or a law of another contracting state in which the CISG would apply, meaning the British buyer could be bound by the terms of the CISG even though Great Britain is not a signatory state to the CISG. A way to avoid being in the second category where the CISG would apply to contracts between a signatory nation and a non-signatory nation is to opt out of that provision under Article 95. Article 95 of the CISG provides that any state may declare at the time of deposit of its instrument of ratification, acceptance, approval, or accession in that it will not be bound by subparagraph 1b of Article 1. So, when a country becomes a signatory nation, it must declare it will not be bound by subparagraph 1b of Article 1. The United States made an Article 95 declaration. <clears throat> if the United States business enters into a contract for the sale of goods with a business located in a non-contracting state, and the private international choice of laws rules of the forum state require application of United States law, the governing law will be state law, or the UCC, in every state except for Louisiana rather than the CISG. And now Leah will explain what types of contracts the CISG applies to. To fall within the scope of the CISG, a transaction must meet four basic requirements. It must be international, a contract for sale, a sale of goods, and have a sufficient relationship with a contracting state. The CISG only governs international sales transactions. Internationality is determined by the principal's place of business of the parties. The places of business must be, for, be in different countries to satisfy this requirement. The nationalities of the parties and the character of the transaction are completely irrelevant. If a party has more than one place of business, his principal place of business will be the one that has the closest relationship to the contract and to its performance. If a party does not have a place of business, reference will be made to his habitual residence. The CISG is limited to contracts of sale. Although the term is not defined within the CISG, other provisions establish the respective obligations of the parties. A seller must deliver the goods and related documents and transfer the property interest in the goods. A buyer must take delivery of the goods and pay for them. Signature features of the CISG tr sales transaction are comparable to those of a domestic sales transaction, namely a transfer in title for a price. Transactions in goods that are not sales are not covered by the CISG. CISG excludes number of sales that would otherwise be within the scope of its provisions. For example, sales of goods bought for personal, family, or household use. The rationale behind this is to avoid superseding domestic consumer protection laws. The CISG excludes sales by auction or on execution or otherwise by authority of law because many special local regulations govern such sales. Basically, the CISG applies to contracts between merchants, not ordinary sales transactions. A contract under the CISG must be for the sale of goods. Goods is not defined, but the meaning can be inferred from the exclusion of stocks, shares, investment securities, negotiable instruments, and money. Elimination of these forms of property, which are all intangible goods, shows that goods are meant to be tangible, movable, form, movable assets whose value is determined by their physical characteristics. The CISG does not apply in the absence of a significant relationship between the transaction and a contracting state. Subsection 1A and B of Article 1 prescribe the nature of this relationship. If one of these subsections is not satisfied, 
The governing law will be determined by the private international choice of law provisions of the state in which the court sits. Even when the CISG does apply, it does not govern all issues that may arise under an international sales contract. Specifically, the CISG only governs contract formation and the rights and obligations of the parties arising under the contract. It is not concerned with the validity of the contract or any of its provisions or the effect that the contract may have on the property and the goods sold. Okay, gap fillers in the CISG. Um, parties should include a gap filling law to supplement the issues not resolved by the convention. And uh, this is because the CISG is a broad statute and it does not cover every single contingency. Necessary to provide, it's also necessary to provide explicit adoption of gap filler law to cover such uncovered contingencies. So things such as choice of law, choice of venue, things that are gonna be important through the contract. There, the CISG is very broad and it doesn't have you know, step-by-step -step procedures like some of the things that you're gonna see in US domestic practice that give perfect direction to where this is gonna go. And so it's very important when structuring an international contract um, to make sure that the gap fillers that you've provided for explicitly in the contract, every single contingency uh, that you could foresee coming up in the contract. Uh, when the CISG applies by default, uh, contracts do not have to be reduced to writing for them to be valid and covered by the CISG. Now, um, Leah's going to talk to you uh, later on more broadly and uh, more in depth about the, the um, statute of frauds provision, but uh, basically the CISG doesn't have the writing requirement that you have um, in America, so as um, things such as in America, um, the amount of goods covered, um, something, you know, for a certain duration, those are going to be required to be in writing. But in the CISG, it's a wide open realm, and um, you can always uh, go without a writing. Uh, the CISG will also apply to international contract between two companies and signatory nations, unless expressly mentioned in the choice of law clause. So if the two countries are signatory nations to the CISG, um, they, the CISG will apply if it's an international business transaction and such that would apply normally, but the parties always have the option to expressly um, take the CISG out of play and say that under the contract that it's not going to apply. Um, sources of law in the CISG, as is generally the case, parties to a contract can decide which substantive law they wish to govern the contract. And again, this is going to be needed to be very explicit in the contract. Um, what country's law is going to apply and, and you know you can pick across the gambit you could put US domestic law, Sharia law, any law of the countries of Western Europe that the United States often does business with. Any of these can be negotiated and uh, put into the contract um, just, just as, the, as the parties would like to do so. However the contract can have an op a choice of law clause that opts out of the CISG as I already uh, mentioned before. If the contract is silent on the choice of law, then the CISG will apply if both companies are located in two countries that are signatories to the convention. And uh, we're going to have a case on this later that goes a little more in depth to that. But it's, you know, even if it's sometimes a certain law is explicitly given, um, if the two com countries are located in signatory nations, if they don't want the CISG to apply, sometimes it will, even as long if they don't, you know, expressly um, exclude it from the contract. Okay, what substantive law applies when there's a gap in the CISG? Uh, the CISG as a whole encompasses numerous aspects of contracting and sales law in its first three parts. However, there are still areas that, although within the cap application of the CISG, are not provided for within its provisions. And that goes back to other gap filling functions and other things that the parties really need to hammer out while, um, while doing the contract. And if you don't want the CISG to apply, again, you really need to make sure that it's expressly excluded in the contract. Uh, the interpretational rules of the CISG contain guidelines for the courts, which is not expressly provided for, but is still within the scope of the convention. And this is more uh, a direction for the courts to resolve cases in an international spirit of the law. And um, for really, you know, we're, as I was said earlier, we're going to speak more on this uh, in specific later on, but courts in America really don't like to construe the CISG to apply. Um, just when it's up in the air, but they really should do so because the CISG is a broadly written statute and it really, anytime there's an international character to a business transaction, it really should apply even if the um, U.S. or other domestic courts would like to construe their law to apply more often in the scenario. 
Um, what substantive law applies when there's a gap in the CISG? Uh, the convention itself prompts us to use Article 7, Section 2, which provides questions concerning matters governed by this convention which are not expressly settled in it are to be settled in conformity with the general principles of which it is based, or in the absence of such principles, in conformity with the law applicable by virtue of the rules of private international law. So this is basically saying that once you follow all the provisions of the CISG, um, you should follow these to the letter. However, if there is a gap in those, the next place is to bump down to private international rules. And this is companies, especially companies that are often engaged in a certain trade, are going to know what these private international rules are, such as you know cost and freight terms, things along those lines. And companies in this business are going to know what those are, and those should be followed, and the courts are going to really, really construe those to be reasonably applicable when the CISG is silent on a certain provision. Um, more gap-filling things, thus the first resort in a gap-filling situation is to resolve the interpretational challenge in accordance with the spirit of convention, as I said before, for the courts to really make sure that they apply the CISG if the, you know, the transaction is international in, in scope. And it's really important for another reason, and that's precedent um, in the international business realm. We really, especially in the United States, but even other places, we have very few precedents that really construe the CISG in you know, a really specific fashion, um, and we really need that precedent uh, to exist. Um, as I said earlier, the general principles must be used first and otherwise applicable law as a last resort. However, in practice, the otherwise applicable law with very few exceptions is always the primary recourse if a solution to a problem is not found clearly in the CISG. And this goes back to where the U.S. domestic courts um, are going to construe domestic law or private international law ahead of the CISG because of a lot of reasons. But one of the two major reasons are um, the general principles in the spirit of the CISG uh, is very vague and especially in common law countries we're used to a very strict and narrow interpretation of statute and you know constitutional law is one of those realms where that's particularly important but um, the CISG is really more based on like civil law statutes where they're written broadly and are meant to cover more things that are not necessarily explicitly spelled out within the, within the statute Courts also find using general principles is too difficult and fill insurmountable issues and are again more comfortable with um, the law that they see uh, every day. Although the drafters of the CISG intended for the convention to be a self-contained unifying force that transcends national legal systems, a significant impediment has been the homeward trend which is the natural tendency of judges and lawyers to place a gloss in the CISG that corresponds to their domestic sales law. Article 71 of the CISG was drafted to counter the homeward trend. It states, in the interpretation of this convention, regard is to be had to its international character and to the need to promote uniformity in its application. What's the biggest problem United States attorneys face when dealing with the CISG? Um. Okay, well, I would change the question a little bit, and we can talk about some problems, but I would say that what I would rather view it as is what are the main opportunities that they have in using the CISG. Um, and there, you would really need to go through a kind of comparison of the CISG with the UCC, which is in effect in, I think, all the states in, in the United States. Um, and there may be areas where your client and you know the smart American lawyer is going to be able to figure out what the client wants and the best way to get that and it may turn out that the, that the best thing for the client is going to be to have the contract be governed by the CISG or it may turn out that the best thing is for the client to have the contract governed by their own state law you know North Carolina law New York law, whatever. So the opportunity is is that basically the lawyer has these kind of, this kind of options, at least two bodies of law that the lawyer should be kind of familiar with. Obviously, the lawyer should be familiar with the law of, of his or her state, but they should obviously but they should also be familiar with the CISG. And so in that sense, they can kind of choose the best framework for their client and then negotiate that out with the other side of the contract. Um, 
and um, and so that's a great opportunity. They can, you know, they can choose these two different regimes depending on which is better. You know, for instance, I mean, one area where there might be a significant difference might be in the way that warranties are handled under the CISG versus the way they're handled in under the UCC. You know, they may want to opt for one or the other. So that's kind of the opportunity, and then then that ends up being the problem too is that. If the lawyer is not aware, in any particular circumstance, that that his or her client is working with a company in a country that has also signed and ratified the CISG, if the lawyer is not aware of that, it's possible that the CISG could apply to their contract, even though they may decide to either not to specify the law in their contract for whatever reason or if they don't specify clearly enough that they're opting out of the CISG, they may have the CISG apply. So that could be a problem if the lawyer is not really paying attention to that. So. Thus, despite their vast similarities, there are many significant differences between the CISG and the UCC that every lawyer should take into account. First, under the UCC, Section 2-201 requires any contract for the sale of goods priced at $500 or more to be evidenced by a writing. However, under the CISG, Article 11 eliminates any mandatory writing requirement for enforcement. Article 11 states that a contract of sale need not be concluded in or evidenced by a writing. However, Article 12 instructs that Article 11 does not apply where any party has its place of business in a contracting state that has made an Article 96 declaration. An Article 96 declaration allows contracting states whose legislation requires contracts of sale to be evidenced in writing to make a declaration that any provision of Article 11 does not apply. Basically, Article 12 allows contracting states to opt out of Article 11 and require a writing to evidence the agreement. Under the UCC, Article 2 uses a reasonable person standard in the interpretation of contract language. However, although under the CISG, although Article 8, subsection 2 recognizes a reasonable person standard, it is qualified by Article 8, subsection 1, which gives preference to the subjective intent of the parties. Objective intent only governs if the subjective intent of the party is discernible. For example, in Wang Dong Light Headgear Factory versus ACI International, the court made clear that the plain language of the CISG requires courts to evaluate a party's subjective intent so long as the other party was aware of that intent. Otherwise, the reasonable person standard will apply. The perfect tender rule, UCC section 2-601, is a provision of the UCC which provides that a buyer has the legal right to insist upon perfect tender or exact conformity with the description in the contract by the seller. Under the UCC, if the seller fails to meet these standards, a buyer may reject the goods. This section of the UCC has no counterpoint in the CISG. As you all know, the UCC's Parole Evidence Rule, Section 2-202 of the UCC, provides that when parties have set forth in writing a final statement of the terms of their contract, those terms cannot be contradicted by evidence of a prior writing or contemporaneous oral agreement. Generally, if you want to be able to enforce a term, you must write it down in the final formal agreement. Conversely, under the CISG, evidence of statements and conduct of the parties may be used as evidence. Those words or actions can be interpreted based on the party's intent or what a reasonable person would have thought the party's intent was. The CISG goes so far as to allow all relevant circumstantial evidence to the, of the case, including negotiations, practices between the parties, usages and subsequent conduct to determine what a reasonable person would have thought the party's intent was. So let's take a closer look. Only under the UCC, the party's written agreement is admissible to determine the intent of the parties to be bound by the specific terms of the contract. No evidence of discussions, prior negotiations, or subsequent conduct is admissible. However, under the UCC, um, under the CISG, there is no parole evidence rule. Most any evidence that contradicts the written contract is admissible. For example, in TV Tunes v. Gerhard Schubert, 
The issue before the court was whether TV's claim against Gerhard should be dismissed before the trial on the ground that there was no written contractual relationship between the plaintiff and the defendant. TV, a corporation with its place of business in the United States, held a U.S. patent on a packaging called BioBox for audio and video cassettes. Gerhard, a German company with its place of business in Germany, entered into a contract through its exclusive agent for the design of the construction of a machine to manufacture the BioBox through TV. For TV. Gerhard delivered the machine almost two years after the agreed delivery date, and the machine failed to meet the expected production rate. TV determinated the project and brought suit against Gerhard for failure to deliver the goods as conforming by, as required by the CISG. Gerhard filed a motion seeking dismissal of TV's claim, arguing that the defendant was not a party to the contract concluded by its exclusive agent, that the agent had not been included in the action and was a necessary party to it. The district court denied the motion because TV had pleaded sufficient facts that the representative was either the actual or apparent agent of the defendant, creating contractual liability for the verbal contract between TV and Gerhard. The court also concluded that the ex executive agent was not a necessary party to the litigation. In the United States, under the UCC, when a buyer contracts for the unique goods, the buyer may require specific performance of the contract. When the court offers specific performance, orders for specific performance, the decree may include payment of the price of the goods, damages, or any other relief the court deems just. Article 46.1 of the CISG allows the buyer to conspel, compel specific performance unless the, the buyer has resorted to another remedy that is inconsistent with specific performance. Read together with Article 28, however, the CISG provides an escape from specific performance when under the laws of a court's own case law involving similar contracts, the court is not bound to enter judgment for specific performance. Good. Uh, offer and acceptance is another situation where the uh, UCC and the CISG differ. Uh, what you all are going to be used to under the CISG is the mailbox rule, which is where the uh, acceptance is effective when sent. So basically, once the offeree sends the acceptance and it hits the mail or whatever other um, medium that they choose to use, then it's going to be uh, effective uh, when sent right there. But under the CISG, acceptance is effective upon receipt, so that the offeror must receive the um, acceptance before it is actually considered a bona fide contract. And it also uh, adds another wrinkle which states that it must be received within the time stated in the offer. And if it's not, then it's gonna, um, not going to be a bona fide contract there. Um, under the Battle of Forms, what you're used to is UCC 2207. Um, if a buyer sends a purchase order and the seller responds with an acknowledgement stating the same price and quantity terms but adding other terms not found in the offer, the acknowledgement may still be an acceptance of the offer forming a contract. And these extra or additional terms are going to be considered mere suggestions and probably going to be worked out over the course of performance by the two parties. So it's not going to, you know, completely take take the contract out if there are additional terms. And uh, this dispenses with the old mirror image rule that uh, used to be the old rule under the UCC, but no longer is. Under the CISG, virtually any additional term in the acknowledgement will convert the seller's acceptance into a counteroffer. Uh, this is the exact opposite of what's under the UCC. And Article 19.1 states a reply to an offer. With, that purports to be an acceptance but contains additions, limitations, or other modifications is a rejection of the offer and constitutes a counter offer. And this is, this uses the old mirror image rule which says an offer must be accepted exactly without any modifications. Um, an attempt to accept the offer on different terms constitutes a rejection of the original offer and creates a counter offer. Whereas under the UCC, we operate under the first shot principle, which is basically the first person to get their contract out is generally going to be the one that controls with the return contract with additional um, terms or modifications are going to be mere suggestions and the court's generally going to find there that the first contract is the one that controls. However, um, the CISG follows the last shot principle, which basically says the last party that gets the exact same contract back from the other party with the exact terminology, no modifications or additions or anything like that, is going to be the one that controls. Um, warranty disclaimers is another area that's different. Um, warranty disclaimers are things in contracts such as any explicit warranties that the seller would like to give the buyer 
in addition to the general implied warranties of merchantability and uh, fitness for a particular purpose. And um, these are permitted under the UCC. You can completely disclaim all warranties as long as they are obvious and are not um, in any way prejudice the seller or, or, or excuse me, the buyer and have a hard time finding finding these um, warranties that are disclaimed. You can generally just get rid of them if you want to. However, the CISG is an open area and we haven't seen any real solid precedent on this point, either forbidding or permitting them. So uh, this is one of the cases where if you do find yourself under the CISG and you have disclaimed certain warranties, um, it's gonna be very up in the air. And so you're really not, not sure how it's gonna come out on that point. Um, force majeure is another um, difference between the UCC and the CISG. Um, except so far as a seller may have assumed a greater obligation and subject to the proceeding on substituted performance, where the causes mentioned in paragraph A affect only a part of the seller's capacity to perform, he may allocate production and deliveries among his customers, but may at his option include regular customers not there and under contract. The section A is left off the PowerPoint here, but basically section A just defines what force et majeure is, and it's kind of an act of God that basically renders a contract um, either impossible or extremely difficult to perform, and it must have been an act which both parties did not foresee nor could have foreseen in the normal course of this contract. And so um, under section B here that I just read to you, um, the seller in the event of a force and majeure clause kicking in, they can manufacture up to the ability that they are able to under this uh, situation, but they also can uh, divvy out some of their manufacturing to their other regular customers, even if they don't have a regular contract at the time of the force and majeure for um, them to be in that. Uh, the seller must notify the buyer seasonably, however, that there will be a delay or non-delivery, and it also must show that the allocation to the other customers is going to be done and in what way that's going to be done. Um, under the CISG, Article 79 provides that in the event of a force et majeure, an impediment under the convention only relieves the party in breach from the liability of damages, but it does not excuse him from performing his contractual obligations. This is very different because basically it seems to construe that the party is not going to be liable in court for the damages in the event of a force et majeure if there's a delay or non-delivery, but it does not make the contract null and void under any other scenario. It seems that the party, which would be the seller in this case, must give all its possible manufacturing to the buyer up to the amount that the contract specifies. It's just going to give him a longer time. Um, the convention, however, does not define what an impediment is, so that's again going to be something that's up in the air. Article 6 of the CISG allows parties to opt out of it, either at the time of contract formation or by subsequent modification. The parties may derogate from or vary the effect of the specific provisions instead of excluding the CISG in its entirety. The only non-variable provision is Article 12. Article 12, as previously discussed, allows a contracting state to retain its domestic law with respect to its writing requirement. In order to opt out of the CISG, the parties must first determine whether the CISG actually applies to their sales contract. If so, the simplest way to opt out is to insert a choice of law provision in the international sales contract. A majority of courts around the world have held that the choice of law clause in an international sale of goods contract, which selects the laws of a contracting state, means that the convention and not the domestic commercial laws of the contracting state will actually apply. The reasoning behind that is that a contracting state has incorporated the CISG into the laws of their country, and that the law that which governs international sales of goods is the CISG. The choice of law provision must explicitly state that the CISG does not apply. Merely designating the law of a particular American state as the governing law will not be sufficient. For example, in Asante Technologies v. PMC Sierra, the court made clear that a choice of law provision which merely specifies the law of a U.S. state or of a contracting state is not enough to exclude the application of the CISG. As you can imagine, there are a wide variety of interpretations of the CISG internationally. The CISG is supposed to be interpreted uniformly. As you remember, Article 7 of the CISG reminds the courts interpreting contracts under the treaty they are to regard the international character of the CISG. 
In the United States, judges have mostly used the UCC to fill in gaps in language, even without first looking to international case law that may be on point. In common law jurisdictions, the general idea is to construe statutes narrowly, but that is not how most civil law countries do, and would probably not be in the international spirit of Article 7, which again calls for a broad interpretation. There is a relatively small amount of United States CISG case law because American judges seem reluctant to apply it. It seems U.S. judges want domestic precedents in their cases first because they are more comfortable with local precedent. The United States judges also rarely look to foreign courts for CISG case law, so the outcome will generally be that U United States substance of law will apply when question arises. Two cases from United States courts are Forrestal Garani v. Daros International Incorporated and BP International v. Empresa Estatal Petróleos de Ecuador. In the Forrestal case, an Argentinian company, Forrestal, contracted for the sale of lumber products, specifically wooden finger joints, with an American buyer, Daros International. In 1999, the companies entered into a verbal agreement whereby Daros would sell the finger joints constructed to, by Forrestal to a third party. Forrestal manufactured and shipped $1.857 million worth of finger joints to Daros. Daros paid Forrestal only $1.458 million that left an unpaid balance of roughly $400,000 on the contract. In 2002, Forstall sued Daros for the balance. Daros argued that the CISG, as adopted and amended by Argentina, required the contracts to be written, and that a verbal agreement between the parties was insufficient to cover the contract under the CISG. Forstall, on the other hand, argued that the CISG, as adopted by Argentina, does not nullify all non-written contracts, and in the alternative, the CISG would not permit the unjust retention of funds, <coughs> which otherwise are required to be paid. The Federal District Court in New Jersey stated that the issue in this case was whether a verbal agreement, the parties to which are citizens of signatory nations, is enforceable where one party is from a state that has made an Article 96 reservation of Article 11, stating that there was only one case on point, the court looked to the general principles on which the CISG was based. The court reasoned that since Argentina had opted out of Article 11 and was one of the parties in the transaction had their principal place of business in Argentina, a written contract was in fact required to show that a contract existed. Summary judgment was granted for Daros. As you can see, in Forrestal, American courts do not look to international law. The court in Forrestal states in its decision, although the CISG has enforced for nearly two decades, there are a few U.S. decisions interpreting this convention. When courts follow the homeward trend, there is large diversity, not uniformity, in international case law, as you will see as Nate discusses the BP oil case. Uh, the BP oil case is another um, important case that deals with the CISG and uh, conflict of law principles. Uh, basically, in this case, we had a um, British company, an Ecuadorian company, who were engaged in an oil trade, and uh, BP actually bought some of its oil for the uh, for the you know, contract from a company in Texas, so that's how Texas is going to be involved here. The major issue was a um, dispute over one of the trade terms involved with shipping the oil from a place in Texas to the uh, Ecuadorian company, and the contract specifically stated that Equ it said jurisdiction, Ecuadorian law will apply. So it's very obvious in the contract that the law of Ecuador, in the event of a dispute over any term in the contract, was going to be the law of Ecuador. Um, however, this case ended up in the uh, district court in Texas, um, and uh, under this, the district court applied the Texas choice of law principles under the diversity of citizenship for the two parties. Uh, under the Texas choice of law principles, it stated that any unambiguous term in the contract related to the choice of law would be given deference and the contract would control under that, as in this case, the uh, laws of Ecuador are going to be the ones that apply. However, the appellate court reversed and the Fifth Circuit stated that the district court ignored the federal question jurisdiction and only proceeded on the diversity of citizenship because the federal question would be uh, the use of the treaty that the U.S. is a party to, which is, of course, the CISG. And so uh, under this case, it stated that, um, that the laws of Ecuador would not apply and that um, other law would apply. And so the um, Ecuadorian company lost in this case and ended up under the CISG, even though they specifically tried to state that they wanted the laws of Ecuador to apply. So this is another warning to international companies that um, even if you don't want to be under the CISG, you must explicitly say so. Even if you think you've ex you know, used other 
some other law from the country that you really wanted, you may not end up under that sometimes. An example of the interpretation of CISG in the international courts is clout case number 176. The issue was whether the standard terms are included into a contract governed by the CISG. This includes standard forms and boilerplate provisions. The CISG does not contain such specific provisions, but the court held the question of interpretation is within the CISG scope of application because it's governed by the rules of contract formation. The German court held that contrary to the position under domestic law, the autonomous conception for the inclusion of standard terms under the CISG requires that the party who wants to rely on its standard terms must send them to the other party. The justification for their inclusion, despite the lack of specific rules, equates to the fact that standard terms generally deal with questions covered by the CSG, namely the rights and duties of the parties. And we will conclude our presentation with some closing thoughts from Professor Schneider. What recommendations do you have for attorneys dealing with the CISG? Okay, for any attorney and all, um, any American attorney who's doing commercial transactions with any kind of international you know, possibility. The, my big recommendation is to take international business transactions at Wake Forest where they will learn something about the CISG and then follow that up with their own study where they really learn the CISG provision paragraph by paragraph so that they understand exactly where and how it differs from the UCC and they can protect their client. If they go into this with the with blindfold and are unaware of, of the real effect of the CISG, they could end up creating some big problems for their clients. So, so the best thing they can do is to learn it backwards and forwards. 